Scripture 101 is a series which seeks to highlight certain books of the Bible and to give its listeners a better appreciation and basic understanding of the Word of God in sacred scriptures. Your program host is Father Jim Corda. Hello and welcome to Scripture 101. I'm Father Jim Corda. Joining me today is Father John Sheridan. Welcome to our show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you, Father Corda. And today we are going to talk about Paul's letter to Philemon. I have to admit, uh, prior to the taping, we talked about the pronunciation of uh, his name. When I was in the seminary many, many years ago, uh, the professor who taught us this particular book uh, said it was Paul's letter to Philemon. So I guess there's different pronunciations, sure. but that's not important. Right. But in our discussion, we'll call him Philemon. Philemon. If that's, that's okay. fine. Very good. Let's, uh, you know, one of our other shows, we talked about uh, Paul's epistle to the Romans, which was his longest uh, right. writing. This is his shortest. And what makes this significant? You know, it's interesting because when the canon of the Bible was put together, Obviously, there were criteria for this. This is the shortest letter that uh, Paul wrote. First of all, let's talk about authorship. Did Paul actually write it? When was it written and to whom it was written? Sure. I read somewhere a few years ago that this we could call the postcard of St. Paul to Philemon. Um, it was it, it, certainly written by Paul. Um, there's very little doubt about that even among the church fathers. There, there seems to be quite a consensus that St. Paul wrote this letter while he was in captivity, whether in Ephesus or Rome isn't clear, but, but probably in Rome um, where he speaks about meeting Onesimus. And he is, um, we're, we're, we believe that he wrote this about 63, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the early 60s before his martyrdom. And we know that Paul was imprisoned in a few different places. Where exactly? So St. Paul, while he was in Rome, was imprisoned um, in, the, in the Mamertine prison, uh, according to tradition, but also for a time he was in, under house arrest, so he could you know, sneak out a bit there. Um, he was also imprisoned in Ephesus, and he had all sorts of other um, occasions to be in trouble, of course, but, uh, but those are the two major imprisonments that, that I can recall. Now, this, uh, this particular letter, uh, is 445 words and 25 verses. So it's really not even a chapter, let's say. Um, he writes it to uh, uh, Philemon. Who is Philemon, first of all? So Philemon was a, a leader in the church of Colossae. So when we hear about the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians, this is um, one of the leaders in that community is, is this Philemon. Um, he also mentions two other people right in the first chapter or in the first verse of the first chapter. That could be his wife and son. We're not quite sure who those people are, um, but also important people in this community. Um, and he's writing to Philemon about um, his escaped slave Onesimus. We're going to get more specific about all that in a moment, but let's just uh, continue to set the stage for this. What was going on in the church of Colossae that uh, Paul had written to? We, we know, at least I believe, uh, geographically it was inland. Uh, and what kind of community was Colossae? Was it uh, um, a highly Christian community? Was it a Gentile uh, converts from Judaism? What type of people, commerce, what was going on? So my understanding is that it's a, most, a largely Gentile Christian community uh, to which Paul is writing here. Uh, but also um, there's, there's a lot of, of, like you're saying, market marketplace work ha happening. Um, I believe it's on a crossroads, um, in the, in, like you said, inland. And so there's a lot of encounter of, of people from all sorts of different parts of the world here um, in this place. Let's uh, go to the idea of um, this as being a prison letter. Uh, we know he wrote it in prison. Uh, what do you think was in his mind and heart, aside from writing it uh, to Philemon? What, what do you think would have been in his heart while Paul was in prison? I think we can see, you know, St. Paul refers to himself in this letter as an old man. And, and I think he's reflecting on his life's work. Uh, for the last, what, 30 years perhaps, he's been working diligently to get this message across. 
And so I imagine for someone like St. Paul, who's worked constantly with and for people to get them to understand this message, it would have been hard to be locked up in one place. Mm -hmm. But still he's able, through his letters, to get the word out and to, to share the gospel of Christ with these people. So while on the one hand I think it was probably very difficult for him to be you know, locked up there or to be imprisoned, in a certain sense he's still able to minister in, a, in an effective way. What's interesting is that Paul, even in this uh, short letter, refers to himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Isn't that an odd phrase? Right. So we, we of course, don't believe that Jesus Christ is the reason that he, well, he didn't, he didn't imprison him himself. But, but on the other hand, it's because of his, of his love for Jesus that he was imprisoned. And of course, St. Paul experienced both sides of this. He was once a persecutor of the Christian message. And um, when he was converted to the faith by Jesus himself in a vision on the road to Damascus, Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Not why are you persecuting my, my flock or my fold or my believers? Why are you persecuting me? And so now that St. Paul has certainly taken to heart this message of the Christian gospel, he sees himself as, as a minister of Christ and one who who is doing the work of Christ as, as an apostle. What's interesting uh, when you were mentioning that is that uh, we oftentimes hear in the scripture that, that Paul was a persecutor of the church. You know, he was really a persecutor of individuals as well, but in the sense we are the church. Right. And those early Christians were the church. Uh, and I think that is really fundamental for the folks that are with us to understand that that we are the church. And what exactly does it mean to call yourself the church? Sure, well, what it means is that we are a part of a, of, of a group that's, that's worldwide, um, that, that has members in all sorts of different backgrounds and socioeconomic realities. To be a part of the church means to be like a part of the body of Christ. St. Paul uses that language himself in one of his letters that we are grafted onto the body of Christ. And so when one member suffers, the whole body suffers. And of course, in our own time, we see the suffering of our Christian brothers and sisters in the Middle East is a very terrible, um, terrible thing that's happening right now. And so persecution of the church isn't something that only happened in the apostolic times, but continues vigorously even today. Mm -hmm. Let's also talk about um, Timothy. Timothy was part uh, and parcel of this as well, uh, but as a companion of Paul, what would have been Timothy's role and how would he in his own right have spread the gospel? For a time, St. Timothy is considered to be almost like a secretary to St. Paul and, or a scribe where he would write down the letters that Paul was perhaps you know, speaking off or, mm -hmm. or perhaps he would be the one to actually write the letter and then St. Paul would, would always include a little thing in his own handwriting which he uh, says in some places very large and unattractive, right? But, but St. Timothy was the one that, that not only accompanied Paul on these journeys, but also really helped to, to get these letters to the communities. And of course, he wasn't the only one. Uh, we also hear about Titus and Tertius and other, other people too, um, whose names perhaps we've forgotten. But St. Timothy is, is of course one of those secretaries. After spending a lot of time with Paul, he would have been sent out on his own to be a bishop of a local church, and which one I, I don't recall I believe right Ephesus. now. Ephesus, yeah. okay. Let's uh, get into the, to the actual uh, letter itself. Uh, we know that obviously he writes this as a prison letter to uh, Philemon. Uh, he's talking about um, a slave who is a beloved of his. We can talk about that. Uh, and his name is Onesimus. Let's just set the scene for the actual 25 verses of this book. Sure. So it seems as if Onesimus was a slave to Philemon and that he at some point escaped. But he became imprisoned in some way with Paul and that's where he encountered him for the first time was in prison. Uh, or perhaps not the first time, but he, he sent him back with this letter or with, with some companions and this letter to Philemon. And he's asking Philemon not to receive him back as a slave, but to receive him back as a brother. Uh, because Onesimus came to accept the message of the gospel during his encounter with Paul during this imprisonment. Let's talk about slavery in first century Palestine. Sure. So 
Um, what, we, what we would see throughout the Roman world, and this was considered part of the Roman territory, is that when lands were conquered, the people there would become slaves to the Roman citizens, right? And so Onesimus, we don't know where he's from or how he became a slave, but, but this is a very typical reality in this time of the world, that the rich um, would have slaves that were foreigners that were, were bound to them in some sort of service. It's interesting because I had read at one point uh, in, my, in my studies that about 25% of the population in the Roman Empire would have been uh, well-to-do, the rest would have been slaves. Yeah. That's kind of a, a big right. uh, gap there. So does that say something about the Roman Empire or does that say something more about uh, the ravages of slavery? I think it speaks to both realities, that certainly the Roman Empire would not have been seen as a peaceful place, though um, we hear about the, the Pax Augustus or the, the Pax Romana, you know, where we have peace, though there wasn't really ever any peace in Rome because the slaves were having these uprisings. We hear about Spartacus, one of um, the slaves who really um, began a great up upheaval in the city of Rome and in the places around Rome. We also, we, we see that this this inequality that exists, of course, is going to lead to unrest. Mm -hmm. So it, it speaks to a, certainly the reality of the Roman Empire, but also it speaks to the, to the reality of slavery, which, which is, of course, very horrific and, and is, is to be condemned. And so that's why St. Paul, he speaks to Philemon as receiving Onesimus back, not as a slave, though he has every right to, but as a brother, and to treat him with equality and love and respect. Do we know the outcome of this? I don't believe that we, we ever hear about how this ended in Scripture, but hopefully, because it's in the Scriptures, we can assume that it had some impact on Philemon and on the community of Colossae. So it wouldn't have been kept if it wasn't something that they thought was important. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm inclined to believe that, that Philemon did, did do what he was asked in that regard by St. Paul. I've often wondered, and, and I remember when I had done some studies in Rome, we talked about this particular book, and there was some speculation about Onesimus, uh, whose name means useful, uh, what he became following his uh, return to Philemon. Uh, you know, did he become a disciple? Did he become a follower? Uh, obviously, he was, he was very touched and moved uh, by Paul in prison. Mm -hmm. So there, there's some mentoring that took place. Uh, is it okay to speculate or is it better that we don't do that? I suppose it's okay to speculate. I did read somewhere recently, and it might have been Wikipedia, so take it for what it's <laughs> worth, that Onesimus did become a bishop of, of a local church. Now, some, uh, we think of bishops, of course, today as like the head of a, a large diocese, um, and that they, they have a mitre and a crozier. In those days, the bishops were people that were chosen by the apostles as their successors to minister to a particular community. And in a certain sense, that's what our bishop is. Um, he's, he's chosen by, the, by the, the successor of Rome and ministers to our community, but um, in a different way, of course, because he has a lot of dealing with authority and, and finances and things like that. But, but to, to think that Onesimus became not only a disciple, but a leader in the church from former slavery to, to this great, um, great position of, of love, really. And what would that have meant to Onesimus, going from a slave in prison to a free person? Right, I think that that, that must have been very powerful for him to, to you know, be free from the shackles of, of slavery, but to bind himself to service of Christ, right? So to move from, from slavery into service, um, I think is, is a beautiful image. And, and in, when we receive the Christian message, isn't that what we do as well? That we, we become free from the shackles of, of slavery to sin and to death and to the devil, and we accept service to the Lord. Before we get into some of the other themes that are in this particular letter, let's talk about um, Paul as an old man, uh, relatively old, uh, in, in prison. Uh, he, he has this very um, marked life where he is traveling here and there and almost everywhere to spread this, this gospel, this good news. Uh, and he now is in prison. 
uh, and his, his life is coming closer to an end. What do you think is going on in his mind and heart at that point? I think we can assume that he's trying to grow closer even still to the Lord, right? So that he can be united with him most perfectly in heaven. I think as, as we grow older, um, we tend to think more about the next life, you know, and, and the legacy that we leave here, but also what, what's in store for us when we leave here. Um, so certainly St. Paul left us a great legacy. Um, he left communities throughout that region of the world where he proclaimed the message of the gospel with love um, and with great vigor. Um, but also he's now thinking about what does that mean for the, for the next step for him. And of course we know that he accepted martyrdom willingly and died for the faith uh, in, in witness to, to the message of the gospel. Let's also talk about one of the themes, which is forgiveness. You know, that, that's uh, very evident in this letter. Uh, first of all, what is forgiveness? Uh, how is it expressed? Uh, where does it come from? And what does it mean in relationship uh, to Christ and the Christian message? Sure, I think I'll start with the last part. Where, how does it come from Christ? We see this on the cross most perfectly, where Christ who's being tormented and crucified and beaten, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Right? So our, our desire to forgive and our, our need to forgive, I think is most perfectly expressed by the Lord, who forgives us from our sins, but also who forgave his, his persecutors. We see that forgiveness means you know, a free gift, right? Mm -hmm. To forgive someone isn't uh, isn't like I'm going to demand something from you to be forgiven. No, for forgiveness is a free gift that you, you've done something wrong to me and I'm going to forgive you, not because you deserve it, but because I am able to, out of love, to forgive you. So that I think is very, there, that, that's very powerful. So for St. Paul to ask Philemon to forgive his, his runaway slave and to welcome him back as a brother is, is certainly the, the, the Christian message at work. Let's talk a little bit more deeply about that whole concept of forgiveness. You know, we oftentimes don't understand it truly as a free gift. You know, sometimes there's a sense that we earn these things because of what I'm doing or who I am, but everything from God is a free gift. How do we comprehend that and how do we get to a point in our life that we understand that that's the reality. Sure, I think that's very hard for us to accept because we we think in terms of you know conditions and we think in terms of um, tit for tat or you know I'm I'm going to do this for you, you're going to do that for me, and so if you've hurt me, you have to reconcile, you have to do something in order to be forgiven. But with the Lord, it's not that way. That we we were created out of love, out of nothing, um, not because we needed to be but because God wanted to share his love with us. And so every time God is working in our lives, it's like that, that he doesn't respond to us because, because we deserve it, but because he wants to show his love for us. And when we love someone, I think that that comes out in that relationship as well, that we don't always do things because we're going to get something back. Especially we see this with parents toward their children. They don't give in order to receive. They give as an expression of love. Let's now talk about that word reconciliation because obviously that's part of this whole uh, epistle as well. Let's uh, talk about what the word reconciliation means uh, and then let's uh, segue into a brief uh, talk about the sacrament of reconciliation as how we express it. We've got about 10 minutes left. Okay, well reconciliation as a term I think has a sense in which uh, we're making things right, right? Um, if you think about, you know, if you if you take a nail and hammer it in the in the fence, and then you go and take the nail out, the holes are still there. But reconciliation is the process through which the holes become covered up, uh, or they become filled in again. Um, so we see in the sacrament of reconciliation that the work of God is to fill in those holes. Um, that we can forgive each other but I can't patch the holes that, that I have caused in your life or whatever, right? But God, through his work in reconciliation and through the sacrament, can patch those holes up so that we can become whole again. 
W H O L E. Now let's interesting uh, analogy. Let's uh, say that, and we get this on occasion. Someone says, "Well, why do I need to go to a priest for confession? I can just tell God I'm sorry, and He forgives me." What do you say about that? I think that there are two two ways to approach this. First of all, that it's important to know that I'm forgiven. And in the sacrament, we know. When we hear the priest say, I absolve you, of course, it's not because of anything that the priest can give, but because Christ can work through the priest. We know that we are forgiven. <clears throat> Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, when I sin, it's a sin against God, first of all, but also every sin is also an, uh, an offense against humanity. And so the priest who works in the person of Christ, but who also stands in the person of the church and he represents the community, can welcome us back to the fold of the church and he can provide for us God's forgiveness because God can work through that priest to do that. Right? So the priest is, is, in a sense, a mediator between God and the church and he can help us to be forgiven by God and welcomed back to the fold of the church. Now, we, of course, believe that our sacraments flow directly from the life and the ministry of Jesus. Obviously, throughout his life, uh, in his ministry, we see that, that forgiveness expressed in many ways. Uh, he, he did that, and you had mentioned, on the cross. He's done it in um, forgiving sins in, in so many ways. Uh, how and why is that expression of forgiveness so important in the ministry of Jesus? Well, I think because our relationship with God is so important that we always want that to be perfect, right? And so Jesus says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so anything that has come between me and God or, or any person in God, we want to uh, bridge the gap that's been caused because of the sin. Uh, and in the sacrament of reconciliation, the Lord repairs the bridge so that we can return to the Lord in a sense. Um, so that because sin has caused such division, the, the reconciliation that the Lord gives can bring unity again to the church and to our hearts. Why do you think reconciliation and forgiveness are such very difficult uh, virtues to express in, in human life uh, in general and in Christian life in particular? I think it's hard for both the person who has been offended and the person who has done the offending because I, I don't want to go and ask someone to be forgiven, but I also don't want to forgive, right? So we have this tension, well, I don't think I'm, I've done anything wrong, right? So um, I think and so it's very important that we can move beyond that. And so Jesus in the gospel says, you need to forgive not only seven times, but seven times 70 times, or seven times 70, or 77 times, or however we translate that. Um, because forgiveness is so important for our, our relationship with the Lord to be perfect, and for our relationship with the church to be perfect as well. You know, oftentimes uh, we look at the cross. The cross is uh, vertical, and the cross is horizontal. So there's that whole sense that, that I, am, I am saved through the cross of Christ, but then uh, we are saved together as a community in Christ. So, right. so the cross really serves as a symbolic reminder of our uh, salvation individually and communally as well. Uh, in our last few minutes together, let's talk about the whole idea of becoming a Christian believer. You know, uh, that was something that um, Onesimus became, a Christian believer, uh, and it was a process. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that, that uh, in his first meeting with Paul, whether it was in that prison setting or prior to that, that uh, he didn't automatically become a believer and say, I want to be baptized now. It's probably a, a process. And then for, for those who, let's say, are interested in becoming a Catholic go through a conversion process. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. Well, in his letter to the Romans, about which we spoke in another episode, we hear St. Paul saying that faith comes through hearing, right? So we can't believe without knowing the message. We can't believe without someone, someone there to teach us the message. 
So now whether or not Onesimus would have begun learning that message living with Philemon and his family in, in the house, um, we don't know, or whether it was because of his encounter with Paul in prison or wherever, we don't know, of course, but certainly it was through hearing the message, but not only hearing it, but seeing it lived out, I think is probably the most superb reason why he would have become a Christian himself and such a faithful follower of the Lord. And let's talk briefly about what we call the RCIA process. Those who are interested in converting, and we use that word converting, uh, but becoming Catholic. Right. Uh, when does it start? What's involved? And uh, just some information for the folks that are with us that might be interested. Sure. Well, the RCIA process takes place at the local parish, right? So if you have an interest in becoming a Catholic, you should consult with the local parish priest or uh, call the parish office to see what, what particularly is required at that parish. But there are some similarities throughout the church about this. So RCIA usually begins with an investigation or a period of, of discernment um, or inquiry, I think is how we put it, a, a period of inquiry where we, we're trying to find out, is this really what I want? Is, it, is becoming a Christian what I want or becoming a Catholic what's good for me now? After that, uh, we can be, you know, we can go one of two ways. If you've been baptized, then it's, um, we consider them candidates. And if they're not baptized, we consider them catechumens, right? So for those who are already baptized, we accept that baptism from other Christian denominations if they're baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And for those who are not baptized, they enter into this period of the catechumenate. Um, and then they become um, chosen by the bishop to, to become Catholics. Um, so that's called the rite of election, where we're, they're sent out by the parish and accepted by the bishop as candidates and um, as the elect for, for admission into the church. And then finally at the Easter vigil, which happens on Holy Saturday evening, um, these, these candidates and elect are welcomed into the church with the Easter sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and Holy Eucharist, whichever they need. And of course, uh, prior to that, uh, let's go back to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Uh, do they make a first reconciliation if necessary? For those who have previously been baptized, yes, they would make a, a first reconciliation. For those who are not baptized previous to the Easter Vigil, they wouldn't receive reconciliation because the sacraments are for the baptized, right? So after Easter, um, hopefully many months after they've sinned for the first time, uh, they can come back. And of course, if they sin only a few days later, they can come back within a week or whatever, right, for the first reconciliation. Uh, but we hope that our sin doesn't happen so soon after Easter. And briefly, just one final word about the letter to Philemon. I think that this letter can be a great source of inspiration for us because we see in, in this letter the conversion that can take place in a soul. We see this with Onesimus, but we also see this with Philemon, that he uh, was a slave owner and he became a, a Christian brother to this, to this young man. Well, Father John Sheridan, thanks again for being with us. We appreciate your insight and your expertise in this letter of Paul to Philemon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. Scripture 101 was a production of CTNY, the Catholic television network of Youngstown. Your program host was Father Jim Corda. futures fall. So does our nation's.